In 1877, the German geographer Richthofen introduced in his famous book, China, a completely new geographical concept, the Silk Road. It starts from Chang'an, extends via the Hershey Corridor all the way to Central Asia, interlinking trade routes and connecting China with the rest of the world. What Richthofen didn't know, however, is that there exists another South Silk Road amid the dense forests and deep mountains in southwestern China. But since it was very old and access to it was cut off, it remained obscure for hundreds of years, its true color undiscovered. This South Silk Road is also called the Ancient Tea Horse Road. With its peak reaching an altitude of just 1,456 meters, in the daytime, Mount Mengding doesn't look that steep or magnificent. Deep in the moist valleys, the earliest spring buds have revealed their tiny tops in the wake of a fall of rain. After the dormancy of winter when their energy has been conserved, the early spring tea leaves have absorbed nourishment throughout the winter, and they now emanate a gentle, refreshing fragrance. The areas surrounding Mount Mengding are perennially shrouded in mist. Here, the annual rainfall averages 1,800 to 2,200 millimeters, and the relative air humidity reaches 77 to 83 percent. From the Tang and Song dynasties, tea produced here served as a precious item of tribute to China's emperors. The tea temple here is dedicated to Wu Li Jian, the master of the tea ceremony who lived about 2,000 years ago. In the year 53 AD, he received an imperial edict to grow tea here. Six hundred years ago, along the road at the foot of the tea mountain, there used to be a Cha Ma Si, a government institution established to monopolize a special transaction, to exchange tea for war horses from the Western Plateau. Only five kilometers away are the traditional tea shops where brick tea is distributed to Tibet. Tea sold to border areas is usually called border tea, and it can be divided into South Route Brick Tea and West Route Brick Tea, with Ya'an and Dujiang Yan as the respective centers of each type. The Tibetan tea has the roughest form. In late spring, farmers pick broader leaves and twigs and after several sessions of steaming and drying, mix it with sticky rice soup. They then press it into a mould to dry it yet again. During this process, the green tea gradually turns dark brown, each tea brick weighing between half a kilo to three kilos. Finally, the ready-made tea brick is wrapped in a strip-shaped bamboo container. After years of continuous refinement, tea cultivation technology has been greatly improved and the yield has also been greatly increased. However, the ancient tea-making technique has been well preserved. Ya'an is the largest tea making center in Sichuan. Approximately 110,000 tons of Sichuan tea is sold to Tibetan areas every year. There have been special tea shops here, some trading in large volumes since the Song dynasty around a thousand years ago. South route brick teas from the surrounding mountain areas are brought together in Ya'an for shipment on a mass scale before embarking on a long and arduous journey.
In the year 112 BC, Zheng Qian, the ambassador to Xi Yu, which comprised Central Asian and West Asian countries including India, returned to Chang'an, the capital city of the great Han Empire. He reported to Emperor Wu that in Daxia, present-day northern Afghanistan, he had seen two items from Sichuan, a bamboo scepter of Qiong and Sichuan brocade. Both were transported by Daxia tradesmen from a country called Sindu. What was known then as Sindhu was India. This tells us that long before the Silk Road, an even more ancient trade route had existed, connecting Sichuan with Central Asian countries via India. Zhang Qian called this obscure road the Sichuan Sindhu Road. Four years later, Zhang Qian was on his second expedition to Xi Yu. The local treasures he brought back were tangibly profitable to the far-sighted emperor who was determined to pioneer an international trade route that connected vast southwestern areas of China with Sindhu and Daxia. In the years between 109 BC and 69 AD, the Han emperors constantly dispatched troops from Sichuan to Yunnan. They marched into Arhai, seized Kunming, crossed the Lantang River, conquered Mount Ailao, and established Yongchang County. The historical records and remains reveal that the Sichuan Sindhu Road of the Qin and Han dynasties later developed into the rediscovered Horse Tea Road. The road we can see today was mostly publicly funded in the Tang and Song dynasties. Road shoulders were constructed on both sides and the road, four meters wide at its widest point, was paved with granite. The ancients deliberately dug deep into the soil so that they could use a large amount of rubble and clay pebbles to strengthen the foundation. As the starting points are different, the T-Horse Road can be traditionally divided into two main routes, the Yunnan-Tibet route and the Sichuan-Tibet route. The Yunnan-Tibet route starts from Xishuangbana, winds northward through Simao and Red Valley into Kunming, and from there goes westward into Chuxiong, Dali, Lijiang, Shangri-La, and finally Chamdo in Tibet. The Sichuan-Tibet route, however, starts from Ya'an or Dujiangyan, winds westward all the way to Chamdo via Kangding, Yajiang, Daocheng, Litang, and Batang. From Chamdo, the road continues to extend westward till it reaches the capital city of Tibet, Lhasa. Along the two main routes, a network of by-roads were built, reaching and interlinking every spot of the huge triangle regions of Yunnan, Tibet, and Sichuan. Mount Alang in the Jiajin mountain range, which stretches some 100 kilometers, has peaks that reach between 3,000 and 5,000 meters, with even the lowest reaching 500 meters. This was the first natural barrier people from Sichuan had to traverse on their way to the Tibetan Plateau. Due to the rugged and narrow road, mules and horses could not pass, so goods had thus to be carried by men all the way from Ya'an to Kangding, a distance of 280 kilometers. On their shoulders, they carried loads weighing over 100 kilograms, On this heavenly road to the plateau, countless lives were lost. However, the long journey of carrying tea to Tibet had only just begun.
Kangding City at the foot of Paoma Hill is located in a border area between the Sichuan Basin and the Tibetan Plateau. From the Kangxi era of the Qing Dynasty to the 1930s, the city developed as the most important distribution hub along the Sichuan-Tibet route. In the 1930s, tea from all parts of Sichuan came together in the Guozhuang in Kangding. A Guozhuang was a kind of tower used as a minority headsman's office or as a transfer station. Later, they gradually evolved into hostels to accommodate tradesmen with goods to distribute. After about a month's trek, the carriers finally arrived at the Guozhuang where they delivered the tea to the Tibetan caravans. In order to enable the mules and horses to carry the goods, block-shaped tea bags replaced the strip-shaped bags, and after being wrapped in durable leather, they were sewn up. The caravans would be travelling for about three months before reaching Tibet. Located in the far east of the Tibetan plateau, Kampa bridges the inland and Tibet. Here, from north to south, run six rivers, from the Nu River to the Jinsha River, and from the Dadu River to the Min River. Amid the lofty mountains lies a unique landscape of deep gullies and gorges, and it's like an enormous vault corridor. For a long time, tea and horses were the two most important goods on this ancient road. But when did this special trade begin? And why did this tea and horse trade last for a thousand years? In the monastery, the monk in charge of tea making is invariably the first to get up. Preparing morning tea for other monks is part of Buddhist practice, and the butter tea must be ready before the morning class ends. In the Sutra Hall, butter tea is the most important offering. Pious followers must offer tea, and rich men should donate tea. Unlike common people, the Lama must follow strict taboos about tea drinking. A Lama can only drink tea three times a day. As a unique Tibetan beverage, butter tea usually goes with roasted barley. Pachinke, 